All right, guys, well, y'all, as y'all continue to eat and enjoy breakfast, uh, we're definitely thankful for our new restaurant, uh, Sunrise, which complimented our breakfast this morning. So uh, if y'all are down near uh, Midtown Medical District downtown, it's a new, uh, relatively new breakfast and lunch spot called Sunrise. So you can thank them with us. Um, my name's John Bryson, excited to be with you this morning and the next couple of weeks uh, to talk a little bit about authentic manhood. Um, one of my great joys is getting men together early in the morning and talking about things that matter. And so uh, I really hope uh, both today and next Friday uh, that we get a, a glimpse, get a taste of uh, some ways to think about how God has designed us. And um, also hope uh, that this becomes a place where uh, you can meet a few new faces and have some uh, good discussion as well. And so I'm going to kind of prime the pump a little bit and uh, teach a little bit and then leave some time for our tables to really get to the good stuff and discuss and process. And so uh, hopefully by the time you leave this morning, like I said, uh, you've been challenged in some new ways to think and also uh, had some really good discussion, a good breakfast, met some good friends, and you're ready for your Friday and the rest of the weekend. We also hope uh, this is a preview of a little fuller extent of some of the authentic manhood material and some new material uh, this coming fall and spring. And so I taught a lot of that the first 10 or 11 years I was in Memphis and then gave it a rest the last two or three years and uh, have written some new material as well as taken some of the older material and uh, ready to make a new investment into the men of our city uh, starting next year. So you can kind of uh, be looking for that and praying with me about how that's going to look and, and what we're going to do there, but uh, we're, we wanted to kind of knock the rust off and get, get, get some investment into our men this morning. So we're going to be talking about the seasons uh, of a man's life. Um, it's important to think about our life not just as life, uh, but life being uh, back to back to back to back to back to back seasons of life. And so uh, the way God's designed life, uh, what worked for you in your 20s probably won't work for you in your 30s. Uh, some of your go-to moves in your 30s probably won't work for you as well in your 40s. And so we, it's important for us as men to understand the seasonality of life um, and uh, to be able to know what season we're in and then even get some wisdom from the uh, men who've gone before us to prepare us for the next seasons of life. Uh, if you've been married for any length of time, I've been married 24 years, uh, you'll know that there's, there's uh, in different seasons, there's different ways you can best serve your wife. And so uh, what worked and was a, really a blessing to her in year five is not probably going to be what's most important for you to be doing in year 10 or year 15. Or uh, a, a wonderful way to serve her when you didn't have kids is probably not the best way to serve her once you have four kids. And so uh, beginning to understand that is, is really important. And so just like we wouldn't head off on a road trip without a map, it's important for us to understand the seasonality of a man's life. And Brian Crenshaw and uh, Brian McCurry, uh, definitely appreciate them contributing to this as well and getting us going. All right, a few key ideas uh, that I think really kind of shape this conversation. Then we're going to speak a little bit to, to some of the seasons of life, or at least a way to think about seasons of life. Uh, one of the first one is the idea of reverse engineering, and this is a phrase that's become more popular over the last couple of decades. We borrow it from the military world, and the business world then picked up on it, and it uh, but during some of the world wars, uh, part of what our military would do is figure out a piece of technology that some other country was using against us and go, man, I would love for us to have that piece of technology or that weapon, and they would take that weapon, <clears throat> which is why spying and espionage and all that was so big uh, during those couple of world wars, and bring it and then reverse engineer it, like break it down into its parts and figure out if we want to end up with a bomb like this, like what do we need to do uh, to create that? And so for us as men to think about our life, to reverse engineer our life is important, to think about, you know, the end in mind, to be thinking about <clears throat> um, where we want to be a decade from now, two decades from now, uh, what we want to be true of our life uh, by the time we enter our 60s or 70s or 80s and begin making decisions uh, today in light of what's coming. It's part of what a leader does is they're not obsessed with the future, but they, they're aware of the future and they have that on their ma map, on their radar. Again, as a Christian, that's always in pencil, right? God's got the ultimate ink pen on our life, uh, but at least we're thinking about that as we process and make decisions. Another key idea is just the power of mentors. Like one of the secret weapons of most uh, 
men's life that I would want to emulate is most of them uh, have really good mentors in their life. And that's the idea that there's uh, keeping some uh, men in front of them that if you're in your 30s, really wise for you to have somebody in their 40s, somebody's in their 50s, and even somebody in their 60s that can get you to think about where you're headed. If you've got, uh, if your wife's pregnant and you can log some time with a guy who's got four kids, uh, that's going to be very valuable to you. Uh, if your wife's pregnant and this is y'all's first kid, and you can grab a couple of breakfasts with a guy whose wife just had a kid last year. Like, that's super important for you. If you're in a certain professional field, and there is someone ahead of you, five, ten years, really valuable, can be really valuable. And so, uh, thinking about these seasons of life, like, don't just go at your season of life alone. Like, lean into the power of mentors. And so, the Bible cast a vision for that, and uh, second to, uh, First Timothy 2, it talks about older men pouring into younger men, uh, the, uh, putting in your head the idea of who, who, what is my bullpen of mentors. Now, we, there's some, we can miss on this in some ways, and we expect somebody to be the uber awesome. There is no Jesus out there to mentor you who's great with their finances and great with their marriage and great in their career and great with their parenting, right? Like that's Bigfoot and the unicorn and Jesus. And so uh, that doesn't exist. So what I try to do is encourage men to, to get a bullpen of mentors. Uh, someone <clears throat> you know you can go to in areas of finances or purchases or maybe someone in your career that really helps or someone you can go to that gives you great parenting advice. Uh, like, always be thinking about a bullpen. I personally like having a bullpen that includes someone, I'm 48, someone in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Again, I may grab lunch once a year, once a quarter, whatever my needs are. Uh, I've just sought, asked permission. Hey, can I give you a call? <clears throat> um, if it's hard to get on your schedule, can I be the one that gives you a ride to the airport? Uh, like, there's no pressure on you. And so there's a guy right now who's 55, has raised six kids, two of them adopted. He's, you know, seven, eight, nine years older than me. And I've just asked him, hey, can I call you occasionally? If it's a bad time for you, don't pick up my call. If you do, I, I'll, the bur uh, burden's on me. I'll simply ask you questions. So if you're driving to Nashville or whatever, um, uh, let me know. I'd love to ask you questions. You don't have to think about me. You don't have to plan our phone call. Just simply, is it okay if I ask you a few questions? And I've never gotten no when I've framed it that way. When I've put a lot of pressure on someone to say, hey, will you mentor me? And the burden's on, all on you to figure out how to best mentor me. Uh, that doesn't go so well. And so mentorship is really important. A key idea as well is the idea of transition, that it is crucial and vital that when, as we talk about these seasons of life that you and I can transition well. When we don't transition well is when things go very, very, very poorly. And so, you know, um, we've all, a lot of us have been, uh, on a college campus and you get a couple years under your belt now you're a junior in college and you see the new freshmen coming in and they're still wearing high school letter jackets and a high school ring and everybody's like oh like that dude you know what I'm saying is still living for Friday nights and man that's just not good well we kind of do that same kind of thing when um, man maybe in our uh, early 20s we're able to be in a several flag football leagues and a couple softball leagues and shoot basketball three mornings a week and got three different games going on. And then we get married and we're still playing basketball three times a week and still in three leagues at night. Um, and then a kid comes, and we're, and, you know, and we just don't transition to the reality of, man, some of the things I was able to do early in my 20s, I can't do now. And uh, for me, some of the things uh, man, I, I loved road trips, guys trips, golf trips, uh, heading out and trying to knock out all the SEC football a game at each stadium. And I had all these dreams to hit every Major League Baseball stadium. And that, they all, that all went away or, or got put on pause by about kid two, right? And uh, because it just didn't feel right leaving a wife and two small children and trying to get to Milwaukee. Um, and so, uh, now that doesn't mean that can't be a future dream, because again, it's, I'm in a season where I'm needed at home a lot. Um, that I can already begin to see some of that changing, but again, it's so important that we are able to transition. Uh, most men get in big time trouble when they stay stuck in a season. They're actually in a new season, but they've never realized that, and they've never uh, said the necessary no's and the new yeses so that they can be fully the leader they're meant to be in this new season. 
So transition is massive. And then the other thing it's important for us to think about when we're thinking about all of our life uh, is the laws of the harvest that Scripture give us, uh, that we reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow, <clears throat> and we reap in a different season than we sow. And so those are those laws of the harvest, that what we do today is shaping our tomorrow. <laughs> so we may not even be much of a futurist. Uh, we may be not much of a future strategic thinker, but the reality is the decisions we made today, uh, the things we put in our body, except for sunrise breakfast, like the, the de decision to exercise or not exercise, the decision to save money or not save money, uh, the decision to save for our kids' college education or not, uh, the decision to grow professionally today or not, is shaping five years from now, eight years from now, and ten years from now, not just shaping it in a multiplying way. So what will, there's a return on whatever it is, those non-investments or investments we're making in a future season. And that's what makes that so tricky because if it, you know, if, if we got zapped immediately, if we put a snicker bar in our mouth and like some cosmic hand slapped our head, like don't eat that, you can't eat that kind of stuff anymore, we'd soon quit eating that. But the tricky things about the law of the harvest is the consequences later. And so like we are shaping, and, and, and it's greater than whatever investment or non-investment we're making today. And so reverse engineering, like where do I want to be at the end of this season or the end of, of my life or the last... Uh, <clears throat> season of my life, and then what can I do now to begin getting myself on a trajectory toward that? Uh, the power of mentors. Um, man, I don't have to figure that out alone. Like, who is it God's placed in my life? I hope, I hope uh, here in the city, here at our church, uh, I know many of you are invited, don't go to fellowship, but just that we, uh, we, we can create a community of men where that's more natural to connect and find some people who can really give you wise advice. Uh, understanding that there's going to be lots of transitions, that I'm going to have to transition, uh, and, trans and change is hard, uh, and I've got to uh, understand when I'm in a period of transition. And then keeping those laws of the harvest in mind as we're uh, thinking about the decisions we make uh, today. Well, let's talk about some of these seasons of life. Uh, there's a lot of people that have done a lot of writing on this. If this is interesting to you, there's fortunately a lot of good stuff out there. People divide up seasons of life differently, so this isn't the end-all, be-all, or these aren't exact, uh, <clears throat> but they just give us a rough starting point. And so let's talk about each of these. First, season of life is that zero to 20 or so. Uh, and I, I would kind of talk about this as a, a time of identity, kind of figuring out who I am, uh, you know, our family of origin shaped some of that for better and for worse. Uh, where we grew up, uh, friends we had around us, uh, um, all of that, uh, you know, who am I, who am I not? A lot of us uh, up until those, uh, in those formative years, uh, um, are wrestling and kind of coming to terms with identity. Am I, am I introverted? Am I extroverted? Am I academic? Am I athletic, musical, or mechanical? Um, we uh, start figuring out kind of how God's wired us and designed us. Uh, if you've got kids, I would argue part of your role, a great role for a dad, is early on helping a kid figure out what they're good at and how God has wired them. Uh, you can begin to see that so early, it's crazy. <laughs> but um, I had a conversation with one of my uh, nine-year-old boys the other day, and he was like, Dad, am I a pretty good singer? I was like, man, you're not actually. And, uh, but that's okay. Like I'm not either. And there's a lot of other things, man, that you are good at, but yeah, let's not think about music as a career. It can be something fun you listen to. And man, when you're alone, you can sing and sing loud. I do that sometimes too, but it's like, like helping my kids understand what they're not. And that's getting harder in our day and age of participation trophies and everybody gets a ribbon and everybody's awesome and everybody can do everything. Like that's, that's what they're getting, even some of our um, schools and leagues and everywhere else. And so I would argue it's even more, like it's even more important for us to help them find clarity on how they're wired and what they're good at and, um, and really uh, develop their strengths. Uh, and then as, as you and I go through that, um, <clears throat> the threat uh, for 20-something, so each of these seasons has a threat and an opportunity. Uh, the threat is to remain in adolescence forever. And so a lot, lot of, uh, you know, these boys who should transition into manhood don't. And we, I talk about that a lot. We talk about that a lot. But a lot of tragically young men in their 20s uh, don't make the transition 
into manhood, and so they stay stuck in adolescence. And they, they you know, like 25, 26, 27, they're still not pursuing a career. They're terrified to take a full-time real job because that, they feel like that's what they're going to have to do for the next 70 years, right? Now, a mentor could help them through that, but when you're 22, 23, 24, it feels like every decision is an 80-year decision. And it feels like a year to invest in this or that is an eternity. Now, you get on my side of 40, you know, and you look back and go, man, where'd that year go? Like a year is nothing. Uh, but man, you can stay stuck in a lot of adolescence. Uh, and a lot of our, tragically in our city, and our culture, a lot of our 26, 27, 28 year olds still look, act, and think like an 18, 19, 20 year old. Um, and that's the great tragedy. They're no more marriable at 28 than they were at 18, except there's now another decade of porn addiction and debt. And so uh, part of our challenge is to really help our 20 somethings especially our uh, men, kind of step on that pathway of noble, authentic manhood early. Again, they don't have to have life figured out. I didn't, you didn't. But they can begin heading toward uh, that and making that transition. And so a lot of you could be super powerful in the lives of our 20-something young men, helping them in the midst of that transition and calling that um, out of them. Uh, uh, great opportunities in this decade is to learn, uh, take your first professional steps, try your first job, make your first professional mistakes, uh, prioritize learning and development uh, over um, uh, all other things. And so I would, I would argue your 20s, man, wherever you can learn and grow, that's where you need to be. Not the city you want to be in, the city you want to raise your kids in. Like all that can happen later. Uh, not the job that pays you the most money, but like where can I position myself to learn and grow? Gordon McDonald said, the mother of all questions for your 20s, and actually every age, is around what person or conviction will I organize my life? And so, you know, this spiritually, teaching theologically to orient uh, your life around the person and the work of Christ. Like, what does it mean for me to settle into gospel centrality where I begin to think about every role I have or will have in light of the gospel. So how does the gospel shape my view of singleness, of marriage, of being a husband, being a dad, being a, a citizen, all those things? Obviously, the, uh, that's uh, kind of into our 20s. We have the opportunity for growth. Uh, we have the threat of extended adolescence, and that takes us to our 30s, uh, <clears throat> the next stage of life. It's typically in this stage of life you begin to hone in on a vocation, and you begin to start or grow a family. Uh, if your 20s is the season uh, that you... you um, that you, you're learning the, the 30s is your season where you begin to see a lot of growth in those areas. And so uh, you're able to kind of find, hopefully go from, I wonder what I want to do to my life, not necessarily to hear, okay, this is it for the next 40 years, but at least you're, you're, you're eliminating a few things you know you don't want to do and you're maybe finding a couple of things that are an option and you're starting uh, to grow. And so I would think about my 30s as a, a, a great decade of growth. And so if I'd put... Learning, identity from my 20, 0 to 20, uh, learning in my 20s, I would put growth in my 30s. Um, that there are, uh, um, it's getting reps. It is uh, sitting, learning how to uh, be a great contributor to a meeting, learning how to re, uh, uh, lead a great meeting. Whatever your skill set is, whatever your industry is, like you're becoming, you're starting, you should be starting to become good at something. And so some of you may have read that Malcolm Gladwell book, Outliers, and he, one of the chapters is the 10,000 hour idea and the idea that really to become an expert on something you have to log 10,000 hours and your late 20s and your 30s is the chance for you to log those hours and begin <clears throat> to get really, really, really good at something. You're all, the threat in this, uh, in your 30s, is, uh, is as your professional life begins probably to take off. And for some of you, that may have been late 20s. For some of you, that'll be early 40s. But again, these aren't exact. But somewhere in there, uh, prof your professional life begins to take off. There's more demands at you at work. Uh, you begin getting a few promotions at the exact same time for most of us that are demands at home begin to grow. No kids becomes one kids becomes two kids, couple of kids. And so in your 30s, if you hadn't faced it yet, you're, you're all of a sudden there's this tension um, that you're managing. And it's not a problem to solve. It's a tension to manage. Uh, balance, the idea of balance is a bad word. I think that's ridiculous. It's just a tension you manage between wanting to grow and contribute at work and demands on you at work and wanting to prove yourself at work uh, that you do have what it takes and you can contribute here and you can get up early and stay late and make it happen 
Um, at the same time, uh, there are more needs that your family has from you at home. And so you're faced with this tension here in your 30s about, man, how, what, you know, how much time is, do I put at work and how much time do I put at home? Then you're working through that for a couple of years. And for most of you, if you go down the same path I did, then you look up and go, I don't, okay, I feel okay about the tension between work and home, but man, I'm not growing spiritually, and I don't have any friends, like, and where does that fit, <laughs> right? Like, I believe this is problematic, especially if you're leading a church, and so it's like, now the tension management becomes, how do I give everything I can give at work, and uh, be on at home, and helping with everything, and... <clears throat> maintain a relationship within my marriage and uh, maintain a, a relationship with the Lord and not be some weird dude that doesn't have friends. Like I've been before when all those responsibilities pile up. I didn't try to purposely distance myself from friends, but what came so naturally for me in the early parts of life, and it probably did for you, that you just looked around and there were tons of friendship options. Like whoever was in my homeroom, whoever I was in the band with, on a sports team with. Uh, then I went to college and it gave me this dorm of like 200 dudes to do stuff with, and it was just like life just kind of handed you as a man friends. And all you did was choose who you connected with from all these options. And then you get into work and marriage and kids and again you look up and you're like man life's not throwing friendship options to me and I men need other men desperate that's why I'm so glad you're here um, but that becomes part of the tension you're managing in your 30s and 40s is I want to do well at work I want, to, I want my spiritual life to grow uh, I want to do well with my wife I want to do well with my kids and I want to have some friends that man I'm journeying through this life together anybody feel that yeah, I'm with you. Yep, those are the sleepy ones. And so, again, you're 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 more than solving that problem. You you're admitting that tension, and you're intentionally trying to walk in that tension, and you're communicating with your spouse that tension. Like once I finally, like I was real resentful about where life had me, and man, to even say yes to a round of golf, I felt guilty because of all, what I felt like were all the much less a men's weekend golf trip that felt like ugh, like I was you know slamming the ball in my wife's face or something. And it's like, I, when, but when I started processing with her about that, I actually found out she wanted that for me as well, and I wanted that for or her. We were actually better spouses when we gifted each other those kinds of spaces and times and valued for each other. I would, I would much rather have my wife at my house six nights a week when that seventh night she's gotten to have a girl's night and had fun than seven nights a week when she's not had that. Like, and she's actually found that out about me. And so figuring that out. All right, 40s to 60s become, for most of us, and at some point in the 40s usually, uh, th this transition to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, influence is what I would write for this age, that uh, um, you, it, it is a new season, you're coming to grips with some of your uh, limitations physically, though it's hard to imagine uh, that for some of you younger guys, uh, your body begins to age, um, you begin to think about, uh, man, have I I've already lived more of my professional life than I've got left. And like, what does that mean? And, and in our culture, this is a massive transition uh, that a lot of men really, really, really struggle to make. And so uh, we've even got the caricature, right, of a, of a midlife crisis where some dude goes crazy and, and leaves his wife and marries some 19-year-old and starts unbuttoning his shirt to here and he buys a convertible and a bunch of gold chains. And, you know, it's just like, yeah, like this is, like, what's he he's trying to hang on to youth, uh, and a lot of that um, uh, we see in, in men who don't transition well, and that, that most would argue that's the toughest transition from, from our youthful years, really, until the middle season of our life, and uh, a lot of us just don't want to let go of youth, and, and middle and, and later seasons of life feel heavy and scary, and <clears throat> The, your physical breakdown becomes more and more and more of an issue. Uh, like I, I, I'm 40. Like I fear my uh, annual physical now. Like I'm just I'm kind of waiting for bad news instead of just like getting it out of the way when I was 32 or whatever or didn't even have an annual physical. What is that? And so, um, but like health becomes a issue and a priority and, and managing that and and doing that at work we tend to uh, have because we've put in those hours right. We tend to have. 
uh, some influence now, more influence than we ever thought about, like because we've got some credibility, because we've actually logged a decade doing some things and hopefully gotten good at a couple of things. And so others want to learn about that. Young men want to learn how we did that and what that looks like. Um, obviously, the threat I mentioned is, is the kind of the midlife crisis guys becoming obsessed with things to hold on to their youth, but the, but the opportunity is influence. And so one author, a guy named David Levinson, calls men between the ages of 45 to 60 the dominant generation at all times. He says that guys in this season create and implement the governing ideas in every sector of society, whether it's politics, business, religion, art, or science. And so uh, incredible uh, run of 15, 20 years. Again, lots of influence given this laws of the harvest. If, you, if you've done this relatively well and really learned to work hard and, and husband well and taking your lumps and somewhat of a decent parent is, is we're, uh, you know, then by the time we get here, we have got tons of influence, especially helping uh, 30 and 20-somethings. And, and, and my, I'm, the guy that mentored me, a guy named Tommy Nelson, just made the comment one time when I was 22, I heard him say it. He was 44. He just said, man, I feel like ministerially in my voice and my teaching, I've had more impact between 40 and 44 than I had between 22 and 40 combined. And I just kind of logged that away, and I remember uh, I got to 40, and I got to 44, and I remember I had the same thought. I was like, man, there are more people listen, have I've been able to influence more things between 42 to 44 uh, than I, all of 22 to 40 combined. And it just kind of, that was true of me as well, maybe true of you as well. But so that opportunity to influence and to steward that well uh, is is the reward of life done well early for a couple of decades and then really stewarding that. And again, that's what it is. It's not a, you know, you don't get a trophy for that. You see yourself, that's not an end zone. It's, a, it's an opportunity to steward that and really pour back in to other people and, and use that to make a difference at your the workplace culture, make a difference in your city. Uh, go sit on, you'll have opportunity, you know, nobody's asking you to sit on a board here and all of a sudden you find yourself People ask you to sit on boards and to speak into organizations or at your work you may become, you may get around the decision making table in that season of life where your input, your decisions like shapes things for other people's life and so it's stewarding that well uh, for the glory of God. And then 60 and beyond, uh, you're entering into uh, um, maybe the argument, this, this is an extended season, uh, uh, statesmanship is what I like to call that season. Uh, that it's a season that should be marked by wisdom, experience, uh, uh, lots of respect. Proverbs 20, 29 says, The glory of young men is their strength, but the splendor of old men is their gray hair. And so hopefully uh, in this season, some of you in this room are in this season, composure, maturity, all that distinguishes um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, these are the patriarchs of our society. These are the say I'll use the word sages. Uh, they're a gift to us as they've lived. I mean, they've had six decades now of wisdom or seven decades of experiences. Uh, the the things they've done well are great gifts to us. Figuring that out, the mistakes they've made are great gifts to us. Uh, it is, in my mind, just a beautiful thing to aspire to, um, and uh, hopefully something we 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 continually value. Um, there's, a, uh, there, there's often a, a reorienting somewhat of life, and so whether that's at 60 or 65 or 70, the, the, nav the threat is navigating the transition of uh, uh, professional work. Uh, I think the realization that uh, somebody's going to be taking my job, like I can't, I'm not, I can't do this forever, uh, admitting that um, uh, I just don't have the energy at 65 I had at 45 or 35, and what's the realities of that at work? When am I going to formally quit working? Am I going to shift to part-time work? Am I going to retire? What do I think about retirement? What's my, what does my company handbook make me do? What, 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 would I do something else? Would I launch some new career? Um, I got a lot of thoughts about the last political election. Uh, we're not going to talk about any of those other than this one single thing. I, me being a guy transitioning, probably on the tail end of my transition into the middle seasons of my life, at 48, one of my one of the things I've wrestled with is fear that I won't have as much energy in my 60s or want to tackle things or that somehow my um, passion years are waning and I'll move into something else. And yet, the last three people standing to be 
to take on the hardest job in the world, President of the United States of America, was a 68-year-old, a 72-year-old, and a 76-year-old. And so uh, when you look at the ages of Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and uh, Bernie, yeah, and I was just like, that's awesome. Like I drew an inspiration from all three of them because I'm wired to want to take the hardest job in the world and to take the hardest, to still want to do that uh, when you're 68, 72, 78. That's pretty cool. And um, and so this is by no means a uh, vision to you know a, shuffle, a decade of shuffleboard, though play it if that you enjoy it. Uh, it's but it is a reorientation to go. How am I going to reorient my life? What is my philosophy and theology of retirement? What does that mean? How's all this going to work? Um, and, and as technology keeps increasing and the age, average age of death keeps increasing, like there's a lot of challenges too. Like, have I earned enough money between 25 and 65 to finance then another 35, 40 years of my life? Like, uh, man, can I pay for 65 to 90 with what I've earned from 25 to 60? Like, this system's broken a little bit. And so, like, that's a reality we've got to think about is, man, how am I going to pay for that life and what's that going to look like? Um, the great opportunity is flexibility, uh, that there tends to be way more flexibility. Obviously, probably an empty nester. Uh, you can probably reorient uh, your work, your work schedule, how much you want to work. Uh, in most situations, not everyone. So you've got great uh, flexibility. Um, the great threat is hearing that voice in your head that you're no longer worth much and there's not much in you to contribute, which is such a lie from the pit of hell because you're in a season of life where you have the most to contribute, though professionally that might mean reorient, reorienting some things. Uh, there's a great... Uh, uh, opportunity there with, with, flex, with flexibility. So I'm going to kind of flip it to the tables now. I want you guys to discuss kind of what resonated, uh, what was helpful. Again, all of these are the big ideas, reverse engineering, the power of mentors, transition, laws of the harvest. Uh, you might kind of share what you might identify if I mentioned a season of your life and, and that's the season of life you're in. And then here's some specific discussion questions. So one of you step up and lead at the table and, and guide your table through uh, these questions. How would you advise younger men who are about to enter your current or previous life stage? That's a great question. Let's definitely start there. Uh, how have you engaged older men in your life who can help with your life journey? And what are particular dangers you need to guard against in this current season? And so it's about 645. Let's give it a good 15 minutes. Uh, if you need to leave at 7 or before, bolt. If you want to hang out, as long as you want to, we'll be here. There's good coffee. Restrooms are in the back corner, and so let's have, uh, if, uh, if you need to jump to a table to make a fuller table, let's do that, and uh, yeah, I'll let you guys have at it. All right, morning. Um, it's 7 o'clock, so I just want to let you guys know that, just to honor your time. I know JB talked about some of those tensions. Some of y'all need to get to work. Some of y'all need to go help kids get off to school. There's still time for that, man. You don't have to bail on that today. Um, next week, what we'll talk about, we talked about uh, transitioning in different seasons of life today. Uh, next week, Brian Crenshaw and I will lead us in two things. One is going to be to see the cycles that tend to repeat themselves throughout the seasons of life that we're in. And so a little different look at what we talked about today. And then I also want to share a little bit how we can especially help uh, this age demographic among us. Some of us, excuse me, some of us have sons. A lot of us have mentors. There's lots of opportunities around the city uh, to bless others that way. How do we help these young men transition through that first season of life through some rites of passage? Like, when does a man become a man? Uh, how does a man become a man? And what are those healthy ways that we can help those zero to 20 year olds? Uh, I'll even share from I've got a 17 year old that still lives in my house. So I'm right in the middle of that. So I just want to share. Uh, some ways that we can help these young men transition to the, the next season that they'll be in. So that's next week, 6 to 7. We'll have breakfast again. Uh, another shout-out to Sunrise Memphis for providing breakfast for us today, for sponsoring that. Thanks to them. Y'all support them. Uh, I'll pray, and then we can go. God, thanks so much for these men uh, who are here today. Thank you for the uh, uh, the families, the workforce, the um, 
the friendships that are represented here, uh, the powerful influence of godly men uh, in this city is uh, so needed. And so I pray even in this day that you give us a head, that you would uh, fill us, that you would use us to be uh, uh, disciples of Christ wherever we go, to live this out in our spheres of influence, uh, to act like men and to be strong and to serve and bless and give and lead in the places that you've called us to do that. Uh, we do thank you for that. Thanks for a church uh, that uh, represents uh, all these generations that we can learn and grow together. Thank you for uh, the blessing of uh, even others who are not a part of our church who are here today who can uh, lock arms with us for a couple weeks and learn and grow together. We're thankful for them as well. Uh, now as we go, again, you fill it, pray that you would fill us, uh, that we could be used greatly for you uh, this day and in the week ahead. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a good week.